I'm Carmine Gallo, and today let's take a deep dive into leadership in a crisis. How do inspiring leaders rally people to their side? I'll be speaking with someone who should know, Simon Schuster, who is a correspondent covering Ukraine and Russia for some 17 years for Time Magazine, and is the author of The Showman, which is, uh, he's been granted extraordinary access to Ukrainian President Zelensky. Uh, Simon, you traveled with Zelensky to a, to the war zone. After the invasion of Russia, you uh, interviewed him in underground bunkers, on trains, and you knew Zelensky before he was president and after he was president. I am fascinated by the transformation. How does a man go from a comedic actor, a former stand-up comic, to a inspiring wartime leader. Throughout his life, he's he's shown quite a knack for uh, taking on new roles and diving into um, new professions. Really, yeah. uh, uh, this this goes back to his earliest days when he started performing as as a kid, as a teenager in, in his in his school, and then really they reached for some um, some ambitious goals uh, and just kind of went for it um he was always surrounded by a, a group of friends they they followed him for the most part throughout his life um a group of friends that he started performing comedy with uh back in the uh, 90s when when he was a kid um and what i heard from them and in, in researching the book you know what, what was it like what, what was he like back then and what was it like watching him evolve you know, they they always described him as being being a very effective leader and and just never doubting himself, having a really strong sense of confidence mm. that he would impart onto them. Yeah. So one one of his friends described to me, you know, um, the, their attempt to um, do something that seemed quite out of reach at the time, start a production company uh, and begin making movies, not just performing on stages, but begin making movies, making comedies, uh, going into into big league television. Um, and, you know, this friend described just everybody feeling like, you know, what do we know about that? You know, there's, there's no chance. Um, and he would tell them, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. And, and that's just something that's been consistent with him and, and his, his relationship with the teams that he has. He, he tends to, to quash pretty quickly any, any kind of fear or self doubt that arises. Um, so it, even though he has transformed um, himself and become a very different person, even in the years that I've known him, um, I think the, some of the qualities have, have persisted in his personality. And, and that's definitely one of them, this kind of abiding confidence that let's just let's just do it and, and figure it out as we go. That's extraordinary. So that explains a lot. It's uh, building on character traits that one already has, maybe building on those strains. Uh, seven hours after the initial invasion of Ukraine, Simon, you write that Zelensky's instincts as an actor kicked in, and he gave himself a pep talk. And he said to himself, they're watching. You're a symbol. You need to act the way a head of state must act. How does a head of state act in an invasion? What was he saying to himself? I think it's it's interesting that he said they're watching. Uh, who are they? They they are all of us. The, it's the entire world was watching at that moment. You know, he, this this was the, the very first day of the invasion. I think we can all remember watching the news um, from from a distance uh, and and experiencing that day through television screens, through the screens of our phones and news feeds. So he first of all he he took note of the fact that that he is now under the eyes of the world. That his audience is now. Everyone, everyone he has ever known, everyone he is ever likely to meet. Um, so th that that cer certainly sort of put him in the frame of mind to um, step into a, a role. Um, and I think the the role that he had in mind, a head of state, you must act the way a head of state acts in wartime. Um, you know, I don't know that there is really a, a set of experiences or a resume. Um, a, a professional career that can prepare you for the kind of role that that he had to play that day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there there is no graduate program in being attacked by a nuclear superpower that wants to kill you and your family and take over your entire country. I think anyone who would find themselves in that position, even a military officer or an experienced politician, 
would have to, in many ways, step into a new role um, because of the level of international attention, because of the, the physical danger, because of, of all of the requirements and challenges of that job, you have to improvise. And, and I think the, the other thing Zelensky told himself is, is you, you have to step into this new role. You, you are now a symbol of the state and, and you have to act like it. Um, you know, what do, what do we do when we, when we step, step into kind of unfamiliar challenges? Um, we look for uh, examples, maybe in films we've seen, maybe people we've met. You know, we, we look, we, we think of, of analogous situations or analogous uh, personas in, in, in history in the past and, and try to draw examples from them. I think he was doing that to a large extent, maybe, you know, imagining Churchill, imagining other military leaders that have found themselves in similar circumstances. Some people compared him to Churchill. I think that in terms of rhetoric, he should be compared to someone like Churchill because Churchill's challenge was to rally the troops. But Zelensky, according to your book and, and your conversations with him, is more aligned or sees himself more aligned with Charlie Chaplin. That that threw me. Charlie Chaplin, why? Yeah, Chaplin, um, it would surprise me that the explanation he gave was that, uh, you know, Chaplin lampooned uh, Hitler in the middle of the Holocaust. He used, as Zelensky put it, the power of information, the power of communication, and yeah. fight against fascism. And uh, the quote that I included in the book from Zelensky is, is that sometimes these artists... And their influence was more powerful in a war than artillery. So that really gives you a sense of the, the kind of leader that he uh, sees himself as, uh, the, the kind of the dimension of the conflict that, that he really um, uh, is, is most comfortable in. It's the information war. It's, it's the war for hearts and minds. Um, and, and that is that is where uh, Charlie Chaplin shined. And, and I think that's that's where Zelensky shines as well. I agree with you. I think that Zelensky understands the not only the power of persuasion, but the power of words. Words matter. Uh, you wrote that many European leaders would have preferred to stay out of the conflict, out of the invasion, out of the war, but Zelensky rallied them to his side. I noticed that when he came to the States and he gave a speech to the joint session of Congress, First, he held up a battle flag from the troops in Bakhmut, and he said, this flag is a symbol of our victory. So once again, uh, he's showing me that he understands the power of symbolism. But then he did something that I think is a, an advanced writing and speech-making skill. He invoked an episode from America's history uh, during the American Revolution. So just like the Battle of Saratoga, the fight for Bakhmut will change the trajectory of our war for independence and for freedom. Where did this come from? Was, uh, I guess, as a comedian, possibly? He was, he was a good writer, wasn't he? I'm just very curious. Does he write these speeches himself? Where did these amazing rhetorical flourishes come from? Yeah, th this was a very consistent um, approach that he took in... in uh many of his wartime speeches the the ones that were um, especially he felt important um he would try to to uh, imagine what were the um nerves that he could strike the the pressure points in the minds of his audience so when he spoke to the german bundestag the parliament for example he he would invoke uh, the holocaust the berlin wall you know episodes from their history that could allow them to feel ukraine's war as something not distant uh, not some territorial dispute in the ruins of the soviet union but really something close to them, something that that, uh, that 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 is a war for the values that Ukraine shares with with uh, Western democracy. Um, so that that was that was a, a tool he used frequently. He he does spend an enormous amount of time working on his own speeches. He has a team of speechwriters. I got to know some of them quite well. But I think more than most leaders, especially leaders whose whose schedules are so packed with other responsibilities, Zelensky takes an enormous amount of time to craft the ideas, the messages of his speeches, and then the speechwriters come in and, and help him own the language. The wars are fought in the minds of men and women long before the shooting starts. He understands that role, doesn't he? Yeah, I, I think in, in that sense, he um, understands just how important in, in a war of this kind um, in, information warfare is. 
Uh, I think especially for a, a situation like Ukraine found itself in, where it was very obvious um, in the early days of the invasion that it did not have the resources to uh, defend itself against Russia, to fend off that attack um, without an enormous influx of Western support. It had maybe enough in its stockpiles to hold on for a few days, um, but really it needed to win over the world and and and, and secure a, a, a really a, a flood of assistance as soon as possible. How do you do that? You have to communicate. You have to win the world over. You have to win their support. You have to show them why this is important to them, why why this is defending their values, their interests, and so on. And he did that. One interesting innovation that he had in his communication strategy was he didn't speak only to uh, other leaders on these kind of secure line telephones that, that uh, presidents usually use to talk to each other. He he did that. He would have constant phone calls with, with his counterparts in, in other countries. But he also made sure to address the people who elected those foreign leaders. So to speak directly to to the the, the public in in the United States, in, in Europe, and other countries, um, by addressing venues like the Grammy Awards, for example, in 2022, he spoke at the Grammy Awards. Um, he spoke a number of times at large gatherings of people on on the squares of European cities who were gathered to to support Ukraine. He would address them by video link on a, on a large screen uh, over the square. Or, or on a stage there, so I think that in, that ensured that there was some kind of there was a, a level of grassroots pressure on those foreign leaders uh, within their own countries to continue uh, staying behind Ukraine and continue providing that support. Yeah, this whole idea of grassroots that reminds me of uh, the power of grassroots and short words, even on a on a video on a phone. Uh, something that you wrote on the second day of the invasion. Uh, Zelensky and his guards left the the relative comfort uh, or the relative safety of a bunker, and they went out in the streets at night. And that's when he delivered a line into a phone that you say ricocheted around the world. And he said, we're all here defending our independence, our country. That's the way it's going to be. Simon, tell me more about the importance of just that line into a phone. Press record, send to the world. Right, hundreds of thousands of people were fleeing the capital. I mean, it, it was it was it was chaos um, in in Kiev that that night. Um, and but on the information war front, uh, Russian um, Kremlin propaganda channels were spreading the rumors that Zelensky had already fled. Oh, I see. Uh, they were doing that in order in order to pressure uh, other officials throughout the hierarchy of the state in Ukraine to also flee if the president has fled then what's the point of sticking her out? Uh, that, that was the message that, that the Russian propaganda channels uh, on social media and, and through television and, and, and other outlets were trying to get across as much as possible. That was false. That was disinformation that they were trying to use to, to, to uh, create cracks within the hierarchy of the Ukrainian state. So Zelensky really needed to, to step out and show them, no, that is not true. We are here. We are defending our land. And, and the other thing he had in mind is that is that courage, when you show it to the public, is contagious. It can be contagious. It really it, it inspires people to say, oh, if, if the, even the president is is staying in his usual compound where he where he works, he's not even evacuating the capital, then that inspires people to to do the same. Um, and and I think it, it did uh, crucially for a lot of these governors, mayors, lower level security officials um, who, who, for uh, the most part, um, to the surprise of many in Ukraine and outside Ukraine, stayed at their posts, as did the president. His posture changed. His tone changed. The way he expressed himself changed. Uh, again, is this uh, intentional or do you think that it's just imbued with, now I have the weight of my country on my shoulders and it's just a natural reaction to a leader meeting the times. I think it's it's a mix. When, when I talked to him about this, you know, for example, in in the in the first months of the invasion, how it had changed him, and and how it had aged him. Uh, you know, physically, you could see that his his face was changing. There were, there were these new creases. He was more pale. He just looked older. There 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 are photos that I included in the book that compare him two months before he took office as president. And then two months after the full-scale invasion, it looks like he's aged maybe 10 years at least. 
you can't fake that kind of thing. So when I when I talked to him about that, you know, he he said that the atrocities that he's he's seeking the Russian forces to commit in Ukraine, the the amount of death, the amount of the, the horror that he's witnessed uh, in in just the early weeks of the invasion, they they had aged him and changed him in ways that he didn't want or expect. So that was not um, something that he could control. It, it wasn't a, a persona that he was trying to embody. But at the same time, you know, there there were elements of, of his wartime leadership that were um, consciously chosen. For example, his outfits, the way he dressed. Mm-hmm. So that, that was a conscious choice uh, to not be wearing a suit in wartime. They they realized early on that he needs to again in stepping into the role of a wartime peer, he needs to dress and look like more of a military commander. Um, it, they felt it wouldn't be appropriate to put on a military uniform. He doesn't hold any military rank, and and that's just a little bit you know old fashioned, not his style. Um, he is not a military officer, but he did uh, begin wearing this kind of um, you know uh, army green t shirts, fleeces, right? These, these kinds of things. And and they then became the the uniform for basically the entire political leadership, yeah. and and they committed to wearing to dressing like that um, as long as the war continued because it, to visually remind people that this is not uh, politics as usual. We are not living in normal times. These are extraordinary times, and 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 our leadership now is the leadership of a, a wartime high command. Uh, we're we're not just um, a, you know a, a president and his cabinet of ministers. Um, we are we are wartime leaders, uh, and and visually they wanted to send those cues, um, and in many ways Zelensky tried to do that, you know, uh, as as well in in his mode of communication. But um, that's just one example. Amazing book, Simon. Congratulations, The Showman. Extraordinary work. Thank you. Thank you so much.